Hello viewers, welcome to the series of uh, lectures that I am uh, taking. Uh, if you like these videos, uh, do subscribe and share with your friends uh, to whomever it is useful. Uh, uh, till the other day, I think uh, I have made approximately around 18 uh, videos uh, pertaining completely to kinematics. That includes uh, 1D motion, 2D motion, circular motion, 2D motion, projectile motion, everything we did. Now today, we from today onwards, we enter a totally different arena. That's what we call as dynamics. Now, dynamics and kinematics, what's the fundamental distinction between the two? The dynamics is uh, uh, the study of motion with the reference to the cause of motion. I mean, what causes the motion? Obviously, force. Force causes the motion. So, we deal with uh, the cause of motion means all kinds of forces that we do discuss here. And what is the basis of all this? The entire basis is uh, Newton's laws of motion. And you know, right from your uh, school days, I think you have been hearing of Newton. Uh, I think this is one uh, uh, great example of how uh, the people live after their death. Newton, I do not know how many people in the world would have referred to his name. Sorry. How many people would have referred to his name? How many papers must have research publications referred his name? I think that's something that would probably never ever come across such kind of a scientist. Uh, in fact, he is the, one of the greatest compilers. And he himself had admitted at one stage that whatever he did uh, was exclusively due to his predecessors. He could only compile them put them in an appropriate form, started defining every term and most of the terms came into existence only after Newton uh, gave his uh, first account of the so-called dynamics, which of course much later, much after him came to be known as uh, classical physics and there is no branch of physics that he didn't touch and uh, it's uh, it's absolutely appropriate to call him as father of classical physics. Don't ask me who the mother is, I do not know. But uh, this is a fact. This is a fact. And if you really consider the, the uh, thanks to the plague, uh, you know, uh, forcing uh, Newton to go back to his village, and uh, as the saying goes, that you're supposed to sit beneath an apple tree. And incidentally, apple fell at that point of time. And uh, on the lighter way, if some of us could have been present, probably we tried to pluck a few more apples and then eat it off. Uh, but then uh, very rarely we would have uh, thought of the way Newton thought about it. Why did the apple fall? And that's where the seeds have begun to grow in his mind. He went on to think, 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 and then uh, wrote uh, uh, a, a complete account of whatever he felt. And then after he went back to his place, while he was talking to some people, he made a reference to all this. And I do not know the other scientist's name. Then he said, why don't you bring it? And when he came back, he never found uh, the first uh, version of what he wrote. And then uh, ultimately he was forced to write the whole thing again and that has become Bible of science, Bible of physics today. Everything is emanated. But uh, let me definitely caution you, it's my personal feeling. Much of what uh, Newton had stated uh, was due to Galileo, if not all. Uh, 
for example, the kinematic equations of motion that you have been using all along were indeed developed by Galileo, but uh, Newton acquired the name. And they are now nothing forcibly. And in fact, the year Galileo died, Newton was born, they never saw each other. But Galileo gave some wonderful thoughts, wonderful experiments, and wonderful equations to us, based on which, of course, uh, Newton built up. Uh, the greatness of Newton, I think, lies in the actually systematizing whatever that existed till then. That systematization is what we call as science, and uh, the rest is history. Uh, we talk of classical physics, particularly now because, uh, you know, uh, till Einstein was born, uh, uh, maybe the latter part of 19th uh, century, or uh, 18th century, uh, I think nobody could give as much of name to physics as Newton gave. I am not undermining the importance of the grades of uh, those scientists, you know. But when you talk of uh, some revolutionizing the whole thing, I think first I would uh, say Galileo, Newton, and then of course Einstein. And Einstein, he, he is the man who uh, talked about uh, uh, mechanics that pertain to the speeds comparable to that of light and is also the man unwillingly developed quantum mechanics. He never liked it. He never liked it. He never accepted it. He had his own doubts about the, the probabilistic nature of that quantum mechanics. Still he developed, but that is the beauty of it. And I think uh, particles uh, whose size is uh, or around Fermi, so not n to minus 15 of a meter, etc. Then, of course, uh, the classical physics doesn't work. And for any speeds uh, comparable to the speed of light, classical physics uh, doesn't work. But this is a very important point. And what we are going to deal with from now onwards are the particles which have size, which we could see, and uh, the speeds are definitely not comparable to that of light. So this is the branch of physics known as classical physics. And then, as I said, that is what Newton actually gave. We will look at uh, what is the contribution of Newton at every stage. But uh, the most fundamental of uh, all this uh, is uh, the famous loss of motion and the definition of force. It's a push or pull. All of us know about that. But then, when Newton gave his first law, we just studied it as a very simple thing. What is the first law? Let us now look at Newton's loss of motion, NLM. Newton's loss of motion. The first law, every body continues to be in a state of rest or of uniform motion unless acted upon by an external force. Look at that. In fact, I can spend about a few hours on discussing this very first law. But I know those great details probably are not required unless somebody wants and puts it in a comment form. I'm not going to deal with all those details, but definitely I'll give you sufficiently long details which are generally um, not directly understood from the book. The books do give it, but then uh, it is very difficult to interpret that. Now, everybody continues to be in a state of rest and of information. The first greatest contribution from Newton is uh, rest and uh, uniform motion are one and the same. He is talking of absolute rest. He is talking of absolute uniform motion. What do you mean uniform motion? Uh, body uh, without changing its direction of motion moving with constant speed. No acceleration. And rest, of course. No, which, which is rest? I mean, everything is relative in this nature. Everything. Anywhere you go and then say that this is what I want to consider as rest. In fact, I am, I feel I am at rest, but I know that I, by being on the earth, I am subject to rotation, I am subject to revolution. All these things. And if I go to some other say, sun, the whole galaxy is moving. So, there is nothing like absolute. And when you refer to rest or uniform motion or velocity or something, 
you need to have a reference frame. Reference frame means a particular point from where I measure my distances, measure my velocities, etc. And then in 3D space, how do you go about? Say maybe you choose one x-axis perpendicular to the y-axis, take x, y as the same plane, perpendicular to the plane of x, y, we take it as a z-axis. Where to choose? Uh, if uh, sun is chosen as the origin to take the so-called absolute reference plane, then maybe uh, some of the stars that are fixed, I take one as x, one as that. But then you see the practicability of applying everything to be counted from uh, sun as the origin is, I think, ridiculous to say the least. It's impossible. How are to go? Well, you have to come on to that. Shall I take center of the earth as the and then in the equatorial plane, then probably I take two axes and the uh, axis perpendicular to this may be x, y, z. I know the whole thing is subject to rotation, revolution, everything. But uh, again, if I have to consider anything uh, from a particular point to another point, I have to measure the distances with respect to uh, the center of the earth. So that also is uh, not practicable. So they went on to define as a local coordinate system. Is uh, in fact they didn't consider the fly the curvature of the surface. Suppose if I'm at this point, this is my origin, and from here I'll try to fix. I'll try to fix uh, my axis. How? The first thing is, uh, towards east, I'll take x-axis. Towards, what do I do? At this point, on the earth's surface, I imagine a tangential plane. In the tangential plane, maybe towards east, x-axis, towards north, y-axis. And perpendicular to this plane, the line, the point, the line joining this point and the center of the earth, going away from this point, that is your z-axis. This is called tangential rectangular coordinate system. No curvature is taken into account and this is how, and that, that's how things are measured even today. Well, then uh, there's they, they overcame the problem of curvature also later on, which is not required for us at this point of time. So that's how you fix it. Now, when you say rest in uniform motion, with respect to this, obviously that's not in uniform motion. Means what? Means what? I cannot think of a particle to be at absolute rest in this universe. It is attached to something or the other. Maybe to the planet, maybe to the solar system, planetary system, maybe to the galaxy, the universe. That is, everything is variable. Therefore, it's very difficult to come across an absolute frame of reference that is fixed or moving with the uniform velocity. So I'm now looking at the negative aspect of the first law of motion. Though the first law, he clearly, uh, probably there is a lurking fact in this first law. The first law tells you that everything is referred with respect to an absolute coordinate system. Absolute inertial coordinate system. Inertial coordinate system. If you want to memorize this again, take it as non-accelerated coordinate system. That is inertial frame of reference, inertial coordinate system. With respect to that, he is talking of rest or uniform motion. And we have just seen qualitatively, it is impossible to have any such system in this universe. Therefore, we conclude, in reality, inertial frames never exist in nature. Never exist in nature. 
everything we compromise on certain things and then I accept that this is a nearly inertial frame. Most of the inertial frames are quasi-inertial frames. I use this word quasi because it's not fully inertial, impossible, but close to that. that that's how it is. So we, we consider inertial coordinate systems likewise. In fact, in fact, inertial coordinate systems are those in which Newton's first law is valid. And now, coming in the reverse, Newton thought of this first and then gave this. And now we say that if we want to define the system, we say it is such a system where the Newton's first law is valid. That's how it is. After all, Newton was aware of uh, uh, the relativity. You know, the first person who talked about relativity, if I ask this question to, I mean, lakhs and millions of people who know science, their first reference uh, is uh, Einstein. No. You know, who is the man who referred to the relativity first? It was Galileo. What a vision, what a brain, what a brain. It's different, I mean. Hats off to those uh, greatest ever scientists, right? So everything is bound to be relative. Even Newton was aware of it. But when you define certain things, they've got to be absolute. That's the reason why you may ask me, oh, well, Newton, was he not aware that such systems do not exist? Of course he knew. He knew. But when you define certain things, definition must be absolute. Uh, for example, a law, if you enact a law, a criminal law or anything, it should be as far as possible an absolute law. So that nobody can interfere with it and then uh, uh, murder it at one stage. In a similar way, when you define certain things, define them absolutely and look at the departures, where it departs from the reality and what you should do, etc. That is acceptable. There's no problem with that. Okay? Right. Now, so the first thing is about uh, if it is initial coordinate system, what is an initial? Every initial coordinate system is at rest or moving with uh, uniform motion relative to any other initial coordinate system. In other words, all ICS are non accelerating. Don't say they are at rest. They may move with uh, uniform velocity, they may be at rest, but if one inertial frame and the other inertial frame, there is only a relative velocity between them, but uh, acceleration is zero, absolute acceleration is zero, therefore relative acceleration is bound to be zero. That is your inertial coordinate system. And with reference to that, he's talking of rest or uniform motion. And then what a beauty, rest, uniform motion, conceptually, Newton could visualize that both are one and the same. Why? If there is a body at rest and I want to move it from its state of rest, I need to apply certain force. And if the body is in uniform motion, to make it depart from uniform motion means what? Either its speed must increase, or its speed must decrease, or its direction must change, whether direction changes, speed changes, there is bound to be acceleration. You know very well. And Newton visualized that unless you apply a force on such a body, which is moving with the uniform velocity, it will not depart from uniform velocity, uniform motion. Body at rest also behaves the same way. So he visualizes that both are one and the same. After all, rest is a special case of uniform motion where the velocity is zero. Here the velocity may be 10, 20, 30, some numerical figure. That's how he visualized. I mean, I would consider that as a, one of the finest contributions of Newton. I mean, I'm talking about the most fundamentals. Most fundamentals. Right? That's number one. We talked of coordinate systems from first law. We talked of rest in uniform motion being one and the same from first law. Then, force concept is introduced in the very first law. Unless, and what force? 
external force. Now, this is really, really interesting. External force. That means there is an internal force also. So, he was very categorical that internal forces never ever contribute to external movement of the body. What a fantastic contribution. Today we can feel everywhere this point. But this is what I said. Then Newton always tried to systematize and then put it in an appropriate form that nobody could ever question. You sit inside a car, nobody is there to help you. You have to push the car by yourself. You can't open the door, so push the car yourself. Would you expect the car to move? Now, when I ask this question to many people, many try to give the answer. Uh, Sir, uh, if I push it, that will push me back. Therefore, uh, uh, these two are cancelled. Well, how did you say this? Well, this is from Newton's third law. Well, I am in the first law. I didn't even speak of second, third laws. How can you talk of third law's uh, application here? And of course, that is ridiculous. And if at all, there is a misconcept pertaining to Newton's third law that is maximum in this uh, country. Uh, particularly at school level, invariably, with the due apologies to the teacher's concern, there could be a, a few teachers who would really understand the concept and probably must have given it to the children. But uh, more often than not, I've heard this concept is given very, very vaguely and wrongly also, if not very wrongly. I'll try to uh, give that uh, thing at a later stage. But I'm now looking at external force in it. He says it's specific because it is external. The external force can only influence this body at rest or body at motion. You may say one force, or two. no, that is immaterial. Net external force. And there is more practical way of talking about first law. Net external force. You may apply like this, I may apply like this. I sum it up. And if there is the sum is not zero, the sum of external forces is zero, then this would prevail. If it is non-zero, then of course this will not remain the same. Rest cannot be rest, uniform motion cannot be uniform motion. So he talked of external force. Means internal forces have no role whatsoever. Have no role whatsoever to affect any changes in the external movements of the bodies. So everybody continues to be in a state of restaurant for motion unless compelled by an external force or agency. This is how Newton's law. So coordinate systems, inertial, non-inertial, we could define. Resting uniform motion, we could define. External and internal forces, we could define. It's a wonderful contribution. Wonderful contribution. Now, this is a pure qualitative way of talking of uh, uh, the force. But if you go to second law, second law, I think, uh, is more coordinated. The total external forces acting on a body or system is directly proportional to the rate of change of momentum of the body or the system of bodies or the particle, whatever. This is uh, the total external forces, sum of all the external forces. Each EF now, I can write it as external plus internal is equal to some constant into dp by dt. The irony is the sum of all internal forces in a given system or for a given body within the body is be it molecular forces, intermolecular forces, subatomic, all forces. 
they sum up to zero. So effectively I can write this as sigma of x and L is uh, going to change the momentum of it. Now we brought in the concept of uh, momentum which we call as uh, linear momentum that is P and it is simply defined as mass times velocity. Why he chose to talk about uh, momentum here? Now this is a very beautiful concept. You know how uh, you know most of the units you look at they are all defined from either products or divisions. When should you take a product? When should you take a division? Now for example I will tell you here 1 kg mass moving with 10 meter per second hits an object. 1 kg mass moving with 10 meter per second hits an object. There is some impact. Fine. I take now 10 kg mass moving with 1 meter per second. You look at its impact. I hope you are able to understand the example. 1 kg mass 10 meter per second. 10 kg mass, 1 meter per second, the impact is virtually the same. Therefore, whether more mass or more velocity, that uh, index is nothing but the product. I can take product as an index and I try to give a name to that index. Incidentally, mass times velocity is given momentum. They have the same impact as I told you, if the product is same. So it's a beautiful concept. Linear momentum, much of what we talk is going to be surrounding linear momentum. We will see that very soon, right? Now this is linear momentum. External forces are going to change the linear momentum. If mass is constant, most of the cases we do not look at as of now variable mass, only constant mass. If that's the case, you have sigma of external is equal to m dv by dt, mass times acceleration. The rate of change of uh, Velocity is nothing but acceleration. We already defined that before. Therefore, we can write the second law, the Newton second law is sigma of external is equal to mass times the acceleration. Uh, this probably is one uh, uh, equation. Uh, I think uh, that found its applications virtually everywhere in science, wherever you want to develop a dynamical equation. This is the fundamental, most fundamental uh, basic equation of dynamics. You may come across uh, and prove so many components in this, so many things. For example, you see, when you say force is a vector, now suppose if I want to now resolve that into around uh, three components x, y, z, probably I can write it as IFX, JFY, KFZ, all this is equal to mass times acceleration. IAX, JY, KZ. Look, in vector notation, all this is of course external only. If that is the case, look at this, I can compare these two. Sigma fx is equal to mAx, sigma fy is equal to mAy, sigma fz is equal to mAc. All mean one and the same. I have only written in component form. But sigma f is equal to ma is the most fundamental dynamical equation. And not only that, this second law is the most fundamental law. Please remember students, for a second law, fundamental primary, because first law can be derived from second law. Third law can be derived from 
second. I will prove it to you. Now let us look at this. For example, if sigma f external is equal to zero, that means no external forces are, if external forces are present, the sum is equal to zero. If that is the case, what is zero? M A bar is zero. M cannot be zero, therefore A bar is zero. A bar zero means dy by dt is zero. This implies V bar is equal to zero or constant. So velocity is zero, state of rest. Velocity is constant, uniform velocity. No external force. That is the essence of first law. We have just seen that a little while ago. Every body continues to be in state of rest, zero velocity, or uniform motion, constant velocity, unless acted upon by external forces. I am driven by external forces. Now, very easily I am able to get derived the first law from second law. That doesn't mean why we remove that first law. You can't, because it has its own utility. It has its own utility, but, but primary law is second law only. Of the three laws, most fundamentally second law. So we derive, we will also derive third law from second law after some time. So I hope you have understood this. This is a very, very important law. I will deal with this in a little and great detail after some time. But uh, this is the most quantitative primary and then most fundamental law. What you are supposed to do, if you want to look at whether a body accelerates or not, you are supposed to look at all forces acting on the body. All forces acting on the body. Then external forces. All external force acting on the body is equal to sigma f external. That is what you are supposed to equate it to mass into acceleration. You may now split it into various components and then write and uh, uh, work on those equations, whatever parameter you want to get, you can. So, all external force acting on the body is imparted or by the body. Who is applying the force is not the criteria. I am trying to push the chair. As far as chair is concerned, my force is acting on the body. That's it. By which agency I am not concerned. At this stage. That is how Newton's second law has to be applied. Newton's second law is meant only for external forces acting on the body. It's a vectorial sum. Wherever you have a vectorial sum problem, resolve them into components and then sum up along each direction and then write those equations separately or combined depending on your interest, okay? Now, this is about uh, uh, some si simple facts of uh, uh, second law. Now, coming to the third law. Well, third law is something that everyone would easily state because the statement is uh, so simple, it appears so simple. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, I think, uh, but one thing I want you to understand, uh, what appears as simple, there's a lot of research behind it. A lot of research behind it. A fellow was asking me, sir, what do you think is a good lecture? So I used to tell them, a good lecture is one which is easy to understand but difficult to deliver. I hope you understood this. If I am talking of a simple statement, to write this uh, one line, it hardly takes few seconds for you. But Newton spent 12 long years after enunciating second law, after enunciating second law, he took 12 long years to state this. How much research would have gone into this? And how hopelessly we interpret this law. 
You call someone, two boys, you ask boy A to slap boy B, and he slaps, and B is upset. The teacher says, why don't you, you slap him back? And that fellow slaps him back. And the teacher, with the two apologies to the teacher, the teacher says, see, this is action. What A did is action. What B did is reaction. And uh, things that are uh, taught experimentally get into the mind very easily, very quickly, whether it is right or wrong. Now, why I said that this statement whether it's right or wrong? Because everyone could easily remember this experiment with them. If uh, this is the case, when A slapped B, B waited for some time and then gave slap back to him. Okay? If that is the case, he may say, I'll give next year. I'll take revenge. No revenge, I have revenge. So I take revenge. What do we call this as? Is this what uh, Newton had uh, got in his mind? Never. First thing about Newton's third law, that action, reaction are simultaneous. First very important point. When I slap somebody, when I slap somebody, my palm touches his cheek and cheek pushes my palm. So if I take one as action, the other is reaction. So it is a simultaneous act. That is number one. Number two, very important. Action, reaction, or act on Different body. This is a very, very important thing. Action, reaction, act on different bodies. For example, A slaps B while slapping palm and cheek. If palm's interaction with cheek is action, the interaction by the cheek on the palm is reaction. Or vice versa. There is no hard and fast rule which one to be called uh, this uh, action in which one uh, reaction. Number three. <clears throat> action, reaction always sum up to zero. They always sum up to zero. The question comes. See, it's very easy for me to confuse you. Zero. Now, that famous uh, Horse pulling the cart. Horse pulls the cart. So you say cart pulls the horse back. Therefore, the sum is zero. If the sum is zero, now they should not move at all because you say sum of external forces is zero. It is a system. Horse cart is a system. Do you recall the way we looked at the second law? What do we say in second law? The sum of all external forces acting on the body or on the system, they alone must be added. Just because there are two forces present there, you don't add them unless they act on the same body. So when a force is by the cart on the horse, are there any other forces acting on the horse you should look at? But if the force is by the horse on the cart, by the horse on the cart, if there are other forces acting on the cart, that you sum up for cart separately, for horse separately. Okay? Now, somebody may say, so suppose uh, I take this as a system. Well, good. If you take horse and cart as a single system, now uh, this action, that reaction, both are internal forces. Even then, <laughs> even then, you should not sum it up. I mean, this is a very, very important point. 
Very important. When I'm sitting inside the car, I'm pushing the car, I'm pushing the car. Now I see, say with 10 newtons. And uh, from understanding of Newton's law, car pushes me with 10 newtons back. So I am immediately saying, no, 10 minus 10, 0. This is ridiculous. Ridiculous. Because Newton's law never states that. Is there any other force acting on the car by you or by somebody else? When I am pushing the say, I am pushing the steering. When I am pushing the steering, look, I may be sitting in the in the driver's seat and when I push it, I'll go back and push simultaneously another part of the car with my back. Yeah. If suppose the seat is not there, this back is not there and then inside the car it is full of grease and oil, nothing else. Somehow you could stand. Now with this you try to push. Remember, uh, there is no force acting on the floor because I removed everything by applying grease and oil. You can't push it. Because the moment you try to push, you will move back. It's impossible for you to push. So whenever I want to push, I push one part of the body, the other part of the body simultaneously when no other force is acting. So, when I am sitting in, in, inside the say, driver's seat, I push the uh, steering and I push that part of that seat also backward. Simultaneously, I am applying on the car, different parts of the car, simultaneously. So, if 10 Newton means 10 Newton must be there on that. Why? Suppose if this is 10, this is 8. There is a net force of 2 newtons, car is bound to move. And you know that car just cannot move. Therefore, the sum is bound, what sum is bound to be zero. When you push the steering, steering is pushing you back with 10 newtons. That is action reaction. When it is simultaneously, your back is pushing the seat, a seat is pushing you. So there is a 10 10 cancelling out. You are saying, but on me, 10 by the steering, 10 by this car. So on me 0, therefore I am not moving. On the car, plus 10, minus 10, that is 0. So car is not moving. I will tell you one another example. You stand somewhere on the floor. Try to jump up without bending. Just try. Uh, you may say, but anywhere you try, you cannot jump. Because with you are trying to use the internal forces to move yourself, you can never ever do that. Never. Impossible. Some people say, sir, the balloon filled with hydrogen, helium, etc. is moving on its own. My dear friends, it is due to a typical force called the external buoyancy force on that. Oh, here it's impossible. Say for example, a person accidentally falls from the top of a say, 12th floor. He is a very good scientist, physicist, he knew. While he fall, he saw a rod. So he suddenly gets some idea. Why can't, by the time he realizes that uh, reflexes may be strong, but he has already come down by about two, three feet. But he's a very good high jumper. So immediately he started jumping and then tried to catch, hold on to that so-called rod. Would he be able to do that? Would he be able to do that? Impossible. Why? While he is falling, there is no platform for him on which he can jump up and go. Impossible. It's simply impossible. So be careful about this when we apply these things. Just because they sum up to zero, you should not add them. Addition, what is the purpose of addition? I mean, they, you can always, what is your age? You say, my, suppose my age is say, around say, 20 years or 30 years. The tree's age is around 1000. So will you say that my age and tree is put to the is say, 10,000, 1020? How much of money you have? 
Ah, myself and my king have around, uh, say, two or three billion dollars. Uh, whereas he has got all the three billion dollars, I have got zero. Say, look, when you are adding, it's for the sake of fun you can't add. It should be some purpose for adding all this. So that purpose is what I'm trying to tell you. Second law is categorical. That you should add all the forces acting on the body only. Don't by the body. Therefore, action, reaction, they act on different bodies. Therefore, you should never add them. Although if you add, it's going to be zero. True. It should be zero. Otherwise, you don't call them as uh, external, I mean, uh, action, reaction. So they sum up to zero. This is a very now look, simultaneous process. Act on different bodies. And they sum up to zero. And another very important thing is uh, action and reaction are opposite. Action, reaction, or opposite, obviously. Otherwise, they cannot sum up to zero. Okay? Now, these are the fundamental. Now, the fifth point is, the fifth point here is, uh, it leads to the conservation of linear momentum principle. A very important conservation principle. We will discuss that in detail. So third law leads to the conservation of linear momentum principle. For example, I'll tell you, there are two bodies, A, B. Let them collide. Let them collide. Initially, let it move with U1, let it move with U2. If we take different direction, same direction. If you took a wide confusion, I am taking like this, U2. After collision, let it become V1, let it become V2, all in the same line. I am talking of the same line, same direction. And if the mass of this body is M1, the mass of this body is M2. What is the initial momentum of this body? Momentum, I told you, is nothing but the product of uh, mass and velocity, the initial momentum of the body. And this is the final momentum of the uh, initial momentum of the second body. This is final momentum of the first body, final momentum of the second body. Let F12 A B force by one on two. Force by one on two. When they interact, I am talking about force by first body on the second. If that is the case, what is this one forced by the second body on the first body? That means what do I do? F, let them interact for a time delta t. The delta t could be a fraction of a second. Uh, they have hit and then this is moving with some other velocity, this is moving with another velocity. Okay? Now, what is the uh, first body, if you take by second body on the first body, what does F21 give you? But if F21 is action, F12 is bound to be reaction. Because by the first body on the second body, is by the second body on the first body simultaneous at the same time. Therefore, these two are opposite to each other. If this is in one direction, this is bound to be in the opposite direction. They should have the same angle. I am now looking at what is F21. F21 results in final momentum minus initial momentum by the time interval. That will give you the actual force acting on the first body. In a similar way, F12 
one two will be what m two v two minus m two u two by there the final momentum minus initial momentum by delta t. Now, but you know one thing. This is minus of this. Okay. So I will do that here. Uh, if I equate these two by delta t, m two v two minus m two u two by delta t with a negative sign because this and this are opposite. So delta t gets cancelled. Now that leaves you with the m one v one. I am bringing minus m two v two on to this side. Minus of minus becomes, uh, and this minus sum when you even goes on to this side, you rearrange. This is nothing but total final momentum. This is nothing but total initial momentum. So effectively, the momentum of the system has not changed. Individual bodies has changed. First body's momentum has changed. Second body's momentum has changed. When you sum up, there is no change. There is no. So that means what? The total linear momentum of the system is constant because there are no external forces acting on the system. Body one is acting on body two. Body two is acting on body one. When I combine these two, there is no external force. All are internal forces. I hope you got this part. That means P is conserved if. Uh, No external forces are present. Now recall your second law. What does your second law tell you? Second law tells you that sigma f external is equal to dp by dt. But if this is zero, this is bound to be zero. This implies p bar is constant. So this is. Look at that. I could derive that essential principle of third law from second law. So I could derive now uh, virtually first law from second law, third law from second law to prove a point that the second law is the most fundamental law. I hope you have understood this. Now we will put a stop to this here.